connection and the connection to rising anti-Asian racist incidents. We are very glad that everybody is here. My name is Duncan McFarland. I am from the US-China People's Friendship Association, New England, which is one of the co-sponsoring organizations. The China Friendship Association, actually founded 1974, uh, is a people-to-people -people organization for understanding and cooperation. And you know, we think when the governments aren't getting along, the people need to step up. And it's vitally important for the U.S. and China to work together on issues such as peace, climate change, and global health. Um, the other co-sponsors tonight are Code Pink, Women for Peace and the Institute for Asian American Studies at the University of Massachusetts in Boston. And the speakers can tell you more about their organizations if they so choose. The title of tonight's program is U.S. Foreign Policy Towards China and Its Impact on Racism Against Asians Nationally and in Boston. Foreign policy and domestic issues are often separated in the public's mind, but they can be very connected uh, in the lives of people, such as in the Asian and Chinese American communities. So we will hear from a panel of three presenters, followed by some time for Q&A, and you can put your questions in the chat. So we have a panel of three speakers tonight. Um, Michael Liu, who's author of Forever Struggle, Activism, Identity, and Survival in Blossom's Chinatown, 1880 to 2018. Uh, that's a recently published book by uh, uh, University of Massachusetts. Uh, Nicole Feller, who is the program coordinator, research associate for the Anti-Asian Racism Project at the Institute for Asian American Studies, University of Massachusetts, Boston. And our, our last speaker is Wei Yu, who is the coordinator of the China is not our enemy campaign at Code Pink. So we're starting off with some context, uh, history of uh, Chinese in, Amer in America, uh, moving towards what's going on now with anti-Asian uh, racism incidents, and then moving on to the foreign policy aspect. So the um, first speaker uh, is Michael who will describe the myriad ways that U.S.-China relations have shaped the fate and course of this community and its turbulent history. Uh, Michael? Okay, uh, thank you. And um, thank you all for being here and for the uh, other groups for organizing this. Uh, so U.S.-China uh, relations have had a long history, uh, actually even before the formation of the country. If you remember the Boston Tea Party, which was a precipitating event in the American Revolution, revolved around imported Chinese goods. And one month after the formation, uh, the founding of the country, a US ship, the Empress of China, left the port, uh, the port of New York to establish a direct connection to China. But the circulation of trade inevitably led to the circulation of labor. So by the 1850s, large numbers of Chinese laborers arrived in California into a recently assembled transcontinental United States. The, re the relationship was, however, one of otherness and contempt. So recall that in the middle 19th century, the U.S. was deeply engaged in, expan in expansion. We believed in manifest destiny, our divine right to take over um, the continental uh, in, uh, United States. Um, the Mexican-American the Mexican War, which ended in 1848, and the 1898 Spanish-American War bracketed the last half of the 19th century. Uh, the Spanish-American War was when we became a full imperialist power uh, and racist characterizations 
of people in color, of people of color, including Chinese, were, were arose and were popularized to justify their subjugation. So an image uh, from uh, Park, a prominent contemporary US publication captured these attitudes. So um, I'm gonna share an image here. Can people see that? I'm not. I'm not seeing it. Okay. Okay. Ah, there we go. Okay. So this. So this is an image from Puck, and uh, it kind of illustrates the attitude of the day. Of the, day. the United States. Uh, this is a 1898, I believe. And the attitude of the day was that, you know, in, in this situation, the United States was a teacher, everybody else, the uh, countries of color were children. So in the front, you can see the, the uh, countries of the Philippines, Hawaii, Puerto Rico, and Cuba, which had been taken uh, in the Spanish American War, the recent Spanish American War uh, from, from Spain. In, uh, behind them, you can see the territories conquered uh, from, from Mexico, uh, and in the front is, you know, well-known states, the large states of Texas and California. In the corner, on on the upper left, you can see a, a, a African American boy washing windows, probably without pay. And in the corner, you can see a uh, one of the indigenous tribes reading a book upside down and outside the door, not yet a colony, uh, are Chinese Americans, I mean, are Chinese. Um, and on the blackboard, it says, the US, the US must govern its new territories with or without their consent until they can govern themselves because of course they're kids and they don't know how to do, they don't know how to govern themselves. So that was sort of a common attitude. Um, so the other key element um, of U.S.-China relations was the continued decline of the Chinese empire. Uh, they could only feebly intervene for their own interests and also for their people. So from the time that Chinese stepped onto uh, U.S. shores, uh, discrimination, scorn, and uh, exploitation characterized their status. Um, so I have another image. Oops. Uh, okay, I gotta move this down. Sorry. I'm having trouble. Okay, I'm just gonna uh, skip that. But basically, it you know, the image I was gonna show you is uh, from the Smithsonian, and it was also from a, a, a magazine in uh, eighteen in the 1871, uh, in which, um, it which gave which expressed the attitudes of a lot of people in the United States toward the Chinese, and one of them said that essentially that Chinese are the lowest form of human life, and that. I, as a white man, am opposed to them on the basis of one race, two uh, industry, three uh, uh, politics, and other, and lastly, in terms of um, ethics. So that, and all, and all the other sentiments uh, were uh, were similarly expressed. So, um, so therefore. You know, and and actually, in the image, United States was uh, government was seen as uh, trying to guarantee Chinese uh, who came to the U.S. Um, fair play, but you know that did not last very long. Um, 
So I'm not going to go into detail into this early period that um, extended into the 20th century uh, and it was and culminated in the 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act, which was the only U.S. immigration law that singled out uh, ethnic or racial group for exclusion. But I wanted to make two points about it. First, in this early period, what's often forgotten is the casual and daily violence against Chinese that occurred, particularly after the 1873 depression, uh, white workers supported by politicians and public bodies led campaigns to drive Chinese out of many areas. The largest lynching in the United States occurred in 1871 in Los Angeles, where 15 Chinese were hung. Six others died or killed by other means. Um, Denver, Seattle, Tacoma, San Jose, Pasadena were among the 300 communities that had similar campaigns and drove Chinese out of their borders. And this is when, of course, the West was, was much more sparsely settled. So that, uh, you know, violence against Chinese and, and Asians is thus, you know, an integral part of U.S. history. Uh, second, since the Chinese, by, by the exclusion, through the Exclusion Act, were denied the right of natural, naturalization, um, this period branded them as permanent aliens. This embedded the view that Chinese were forever, forever foreign and thus suspect, and this would subject them, subject them to future changes in U.S.-China relations. Uh, also, anti-Chinese sentiment was national in scope. The state of Massachusetts, you know, where, where I live, for example, prohibited Chinese from more than 20 uh, occupations. Other state laws re restricted employment to citizens or union members, disqualifying Chinese. They could only find housing in um, undesirable areas. And a social worker for one of the largest settlement houses in the city express a typical sentiment saying that Chinese, quote, can never be in any sense American, end quote. So Chinese Americans remain a marginalized population during the decades following 1882. Those notable changes in attitudes only followed changes in US-China relations. China, which became a rep republic in 1911, was an ally of the United States during World War I. But it was the Japanese encroachment into China, the Sino-Japanese War, and reported Japanese abuses in the 1930s that led the US press and the public to adopt a more sympathetic attitude toward Chinese Americans. And this only strengthened with the entrance of the United, the United States uh, in the war in 1945, and, and China was a, again a wartime ally. So this war eventually loosened the restrictions on Chinese immigration, but Chinese exclusion was an increasingly embarrassing policy. The Japanese used it as propaganda fodder for the wartime uh, radio broadcasts, and there were protests in both China and the United States against, against the policy. So China repealed it. I mean, Congress repealed the Exclusion Act in 1943, but it revealed its continuing prejudice by limiting the quota of immigration to 105 annually. Um, but how the things became better, um, you know, Chinese could finally become naturalized. Um, Ch Chinese could housing segregation decreased, even though the, there was still discrimination. Uh, Chinese would begin to live outside of the uh, Chinese enclaves. Uh, and then wartime necessity, necessity opened up occupations to Chinese who had been prim primarily limited to laundries and restaurants. And like other soldiers of color, Chinese American returning veterans began to view themselves as, as deserving of more equal rights. So in the immediate post-World War II period, through the immigration of small 
numbers of professionals through the War Brides Act, which allowed Chinese American women in, which had the Exclusion Act had had uh, had uh, for, for, forbade, and to other small groups, the first family-based community structure for, uh, began to build in the Chinese American community. But in 1949, the, the communist victory in the Chinese Civil War led to reversions. This was the early Cold War and right-wing McCarthyism prevailed. One of its main issues was, quote, who lost China? Implying the presence of traitors and subversives. Despite the Chinese American community leadership's staunch anti-communism, suspicion of the population was part of the campaign. Immigration became much more difficult. Uh, Left-oriented community organizations were physically attacked and harassed. Mainstream Chinese community organizations were subpoenaed. FBI investigations in the, in the Chinatown initiated and grand juries were impaneled. Beginning in 1956 and lasting a decade, the Immigration and Naturalization Service uh, had an investigation with, which ensnared a sizable proportion of the community. The Chinese Confession Program probed the immigration status of, the, of many community members, part of the hunt for resident traders. It affected one in three Chinese Americans, including war veterans. This period led to imprisonment, uh, deportation, and at least one suicide. And so therefore, in the space of a few years, Chinese Americans were seen as a late alien others, then allies, and then potential traders, dependent uh, on the vagaries of US-China relations. Since the 1960s, the superpower role and posture of the United States, the civil rights and black power movement and immigration law reform uh, opened a more benign period for, for Chinese and Asian Americans. More directly, the establishment of relations with the People's Republic of China and attempts to pull it into the neoliberal global order have created a more peaceful environment. However, this last phase is ending now and I think the other panelists will speak to the consequent present conditions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael, um, <clears throat> for providing that historical, um, showing that there are deep roots in uh, uh, current uh, events in uh, US history. Uh, and now our second speaker um, is Nicole, uh, who will discuss the relationship between U.S. policies and practices, and the surge in reported hate crimes and incidents against Asians in Massachusetts since the onset of COVID-19. Uh, Nicole? Thank you, Duncan. Um, and thank you to the Friendship Association for inviting me um, and to the other organizations that have um, um, organized this event. Um, and thank you to Michael for bringing us through uh, quite a long history and one that uh, we need to keep remembering um, so as not so as to better understand what is going on right now, um, a, a low in uh, anti-China and anti-Asian sentiments here in the United States. So um, I am the program coordinator and research associate for the Anti-Asian Racism Project at the Institute for Asian American Studies at UMass Boston. Um, I am fairly new to Boston and new to Massachusetts, uh, so this has been a learning process, um, kind of understanding the different ways racism uh, uh, manifests and um, is shaped uh, by the more local context, um, and certainly uh, Massachusetts has not been immune to um, the hatred, um, vitriol, and violence um, um, against Asians and particularly against Chinese or those suspected of being Chinese. Um, I'm going to draw from a few sources uh, 
uh, data from various different um, organizations over the past few years, including um, the Institute for Asian American Studies, as well as AAPI data. Um, a lot of the data I'm going to share with you are, is from um, Stop AAPI Hate, um, an organization, a racial justice, co uh, uh, racial justice coalition um, based in San Francisco that has been collecting um, um, reports online of incidents of anti uh, 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 hate incidents, incidents of hate hate incidents against Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders um, since March 2020. Um, I'll also share a bit of uh, data from the Federal Bureau of Investigation tracking um, hate crimes, as well as um, the stories from um, and personal testimonies from community members here in Boston, um, um, and especially in Chinatown, who have shared their personal experiences um, um, with racist, xenophobic hate. So, uh, even prior to um, uh, COVID-19, um, President Trump had uh, campaigned um, um, and fulfilled the promises of the Muslim ban um, in 2016, uh, launched the China Initiative in uh, 2018, um, only recently to be ended. Um, and uh, as soon as, um, COVID-19 began, um, or the onset of COVID-19, um, at the highest levels of office, the pandemic has been racialized as a Chinese virus, um, but uh, the view um, uh, or the suspicion with which Chinese uh, and other Asians are um, um, treated uh, based on their association with their home country, um, continues uh, and uh, Gang Chen was one of the hundreds of uh, cases, um, uh, false um, prosecutions, false accusations of espionage that have destroyed the careers of Chinese Americans uh, even prior to COVID-19. So the, the racist rhetoric um, that uh, persisted um, from the beginning of the COVID-19, from the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic in March, 2020, um, labeling COVID-19 as the China virus, insisting that China is to blame um, because of the health pandemic, uh, to blame uh, for the health pandemic because of the quote culture. Um, and uh, over the past, uh, over the two years um, since, the explicit and overt racist rhetoric um, at the highest levels of office, Stop AAPI Hate received over 11,000 reports of hate incidents against Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders nationwide. As of early 2022, a uh, um, survey by uh, um, Launch and the Asian American Foundation found that about 20% of, of Americans overall believe that Asian Americans are at least partially responsible for COVID-19. And this is an increase uh, compared to the survey taken in 2021. More recently uh, in Texas, the uh, proposal of Senate Bill 147 to ban Chinese as well as Iranians, North Koreans, and Russians who are not uh, citizens from owning land is uh, certainly uh, a, a, a repetition of history um, of the kinds of racist laws like the uh, alien land laws um, and the Chinese Exclusion Act. And even more recently, in uh, just last month, um, Representative Lance Gooden questioned the quote, loyalty and competence of uh, Rep. Judy Chu, who is the chairwoman of the Congressional APA Caucus. Um, and of course, this uh, the, the kinds of everyday violence um, and mass uh, tragedies, mass shootings, uh, certainly are not covered in, in just this list of events. But uh, the um, increasing um, animosity towards China um, is certainly having an effect on, on not only Chinese in uh, 
um, not only Chinese uh, in the United States, but other Asian Americans as well. So these are these are reports um, from Stop AAPI Hate and uh, um, that were submitted to Stop AAPI Hate um, from um, United States overall and and in Massachusetts. So Massachusetts, um, their uh, Stop AAPI Hate received 340 um, reports of anti AAPI incidents um, in Massachusetts. or about 1.6% of all uh, reports. Sorry, about 3% of all reports. N nationwide, one in five incidents involved uh, language that explicitly scapegoats Asian and Asian Americans. That includes wrongfully blaming them for COVID-19, uh, blaming them for espionage on behalf of the Communist Party, um, or blaming them for economic insecurity. So a significant share, uh, um, thousands of, of incidents and even incidents that have occurred in uh, Massachusetts um, are explicitly mirroring the, the rhetoric, um, um, the anti-China rhetoric, uh, blaming Chinese culture, Chinese people, um, and it's uh, having a direct effect on the lives, the physical, the mental, the financial well-being of members of the Asian American community. So verbal and physical, uh, verbal hate speech and harassment comprised uh, the largest share of, of incidents, both the United States and in Massachusetts. Uh, but physical assaults um, um, are still a, a, a significant share, both in Massachusetts and in, and in uh, nationwide. Um, more recently, uh, in Quincy, uh, um, these kind of uh, um, overt uh, anti-China rhetoric that's appearing in uh, um, it, uh, incidents, hate incidents and hate crimes, um, recently occurred in, in Quincy, Massachusetts, a town with uh, uh, one of the largest Asian American populations in, in Massachusetts. And uh, um, um, uh, just south of, of the city of Boston, yelling racial epithets as uh, he was uh, uh, an Asian man was, was uh, run over by a car. Many of these incidents don't capture the toll that um, xenophobia and racism, hatred takes on the lives of, of our members of our community every day. Uh, so a twice unborn born grandfather in his 80s explained in a listening session in June uh, love last year that he and his wife lived daily, fearing that they would be deported due, anti, due to anti-immigrant rhetoric and misinformation. Usually, usually an active person, he didn't leave his apartment for weeks and spent countless nights without sleep and started experiencing dizziness. The incidents uh, that were reported to stop AAPI hate, um, uh, a plurality occur in public streets and spaces uh, followed by businesses. And we've heard countless stories um, and seen countless examples of harassment and physical assaults uh, in public streets and near businesses in spaces where uh, Asian Americans frequent and feel safe um, and have built community. In April, 2022, uh, an Asian woman elder and resident of Massachusetts for nearly 50 years was approached from the side and punched in the face while leaving a bakery in Boston's Chinatown. She shared her story uh, with uh, Council President Flynn um, and on uh, public uh, uh, news media. Her daughter also shared how difficult it was um, to, to find resources, to know what to do after, um, feeling that the police weren't able to help and didn't provide 
uh, any kind of, of redress. There are several uh, um, uh, narratives in uh, Stop AAPI Hate reports from Boston, Massachusetts, um, and I invite you to check those out. Um, however, only 38% of the incidents submitted to Stop AAPI Hate came from Boston, the city of Boston. So the majority, uh, um, meaning that that this is happening not only in, in Boston, but also throughout Massachusetts. And quickly, uh, a few surveys um, have shown in, that the uh, incidents that has been submitted to Stop AAPI Hate might even um, uh, underestimate uh, or be biased in terms of who shares those incidents. And I should mention that uh, the people who are reporting incidents to stop AAP, AAPI hate from Massachusetts uh, were 54% uh, uh, Chinese, more likely to be women, and more likely to be younger than nationwide reports. Hate crimes uh, against anti-Asian hate crimes or hate crimes against Asian Americans uh, seem to be uh, um, abating or decreasing 54% uh, of a Asians in an a API data uh, momentum poll uh, in March of 2022 indicated that they had experienced a hate crime or hate incident in 2021. Um, it, it, as of early March, 2022, that percentage had uh, was 28%, uh, suggesting a slight um, abatement. So Asian Americans are not the only uh, victims of hate crimes or hate incidents in, in a time of overt white supremacist violence. And uh, the AAPI data poll also shows this. The IAS COVID-19 survey, which focused on low income immigrant, uh, limited English speaking Asian Americans in the greater Boston area also found that uh, um, Incidents of, of um, racial harassment and discrimination um, are certainly not um, uh, uncommon. Uh, and these experiences have been hidden from existing surveys or previous surveys that uh, tend to lump Asian Americans together and not understand our diversities and disparities within the community. Uh, I'll end um, with, with this slide. Um, or I'll skip a few slides since I think we're running out of time. Um, but I want to mention that even in the most conservative estimates of um, hate crimes that are reported by law enforcement, by Massachusetts law enforcement, anti-Asian hate crimes in Massachusetts increased um, by more than 100% um, from before the pandemic uh, through 2021. Uh, so uh, there were 14 reported anti-Asian hate crime incidents by Massachusetts law enforcement in 2020. 19 in 2021, that number was 30. Um, and to put this in perspective, hate crimes, uh, law enforcement reported hate crimes have been increasing um, since before the pandemic. Um, Asian Americans, uh, anti-Asian hate crimes um, increased throughout both the first and the second years of the pandemic, while several other groups saw, several other racial groups um, saw uh, increases in, in hate crimes, racially motivated hate crimes, um, especially anti-Black hate crimes, uh, while that number declined in 2021. And among uh, uh, other racial groups, that increased for Asian, kept increasing for Asian Americans, and it also increased for uh, anti-Arab hate crimes. So what we are doing now and what we continue to hope continue to do, uh, focusing on reducing barriers to reporting hate crimes and other experiences of discrimination. Um, this, uh, we're well aware of the barriers to reporting both on the side of the individuals and groups that are targeted, um, but also on the side of law enforcement who might not understand anti-Asian racism or the kinds of discrimination uh, that people of Asian descent uh, experience on a daily basis. 
We're also prioritizing the physical, mental, and financial health and well-being of those impacted, most impacted by anti-Asian hate, violence, and racism, particularly Chinese Americans, immigrants, limited English speakers, um, and elders. Promoting education about Asian American history experience, identity, and contributions to advancing social justice, similar to what uh, Forever Struggle, the book is about, uh, and also in relation to other racial and ethnic groups. Uh, finally, it's important that we're ensuring that businesses and other places in the community are hate-free zones. So spaces where Asian Americans, this could be Asian-owned businesses in Massachusetts, um, uh, committing to uh, creating spaces for anyone who feels unsafe to um, uh, um, have a point of refuge, um, a place to regroup, um, uh, figure out what to do next, learn about resources. Um, and so this is where we're heading next for our group. But um, uh, we also uh, have by bystander trainings um, and uh, um, self-defense and other community of events um, to ensure that these issues are being addressed. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nikki. Um, I'm responding to one question, a recording of this event will be sent to all participants. Um, and in, in reference to the, uh, the trainings, uh, somebody can put in the chat, there's an email that was provided um, where people can write for more information about um, anti-racism trainings. Um, we'll also uh, send out information about that uh, to the participants. Thank you so much. And our last speaker is uh, Wei Yu um, from Code Pink, and her topic is Towards Peace, Cooperation, and Normal U.S.-China Relations. Um, Wei? Thank you so much, Duncan, and thank you to Nikki and also Michael, who spoke earlier. Um, unlike everyone else on this panel, um, I don't live in Boston. Uh, I live in um, Southern California, not hasn't been very sunny for us recently. But yeah, I actually grew up in the city in Los Angeles County called Monterey Park. Um, we I remember um, my family used to love to go to this like one restaurant owned by um, some Chinese American folks who were born in the same um, city as my family. And we like when, whenever we were going to the restaurant, it would be my only opportunity to not just practice Mandarin, but also practice my dialect. Um, I also did um, marching band in high school. I know I'm nerdy. I did a marching band in high school and I used to get all of my supplies from this independent music store also located in Monterey Park. So even though I don't live there anymore, the city still is like a very, um, I have so many like good amazing memories associated with the place and also the community and the city recently got infamous because of a mass shooting that took place um on january 21st which was the eve of lunar new year the biggest cultural holidays for east asian and also southeast asian communities um the mass shooting took away 11 lives and the gunman also took his own life after that and um it's it 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 just shook the community and right after the tragedy uh local leaders as well as um answer coalition which is one of uh code pink's close partners um the los angeles chapter they organize vigils to mourn the losses and actually yesterday president biden visited monterey park and delivered an address um on gun control however this address of a tragedy that devastated the local Chinese American community came just one day that President Biden sold nuclear submarines to kill our family in China. Just the day before yesterday, um, President Biden was in San Diego finalizing a deal with Australia to sell nuclear powered attack submarines to militarize the Asia Pacific and also prepare for a war with China. So this is just one example that we see with this uh, rampant aggression towards China. 
Um, last week, President Biden issued his budget proposal for the year 2024. And on Monday, Pentagon also submitted their um, budget request. And that included $15.3 billion for war with China and specifically the Indo-Pacific Command. For the first time, they got to submit their own budget request, which nearly tripled the amount last year. So where do all of this money go? They are um, just adding to this aggression towards China and really just hating the Asian American and Pacific Islander community. Um, so with um, not just Australia, it, we have a lot of weapon sales going on. Um, the militarization of the Asia Pacific, we also see um, a, a great example of this is Guam. So the U.S. Marine recently reopened a military base in Guam. Um, even though that's kind of recent in January, the construction of these new military facilities have been going on for a while. And they are building, uh, they are having these constructions on ancestral burial ground, um, killing people's past. And these constructions are also contaminating drinking water, which is killing people's future. Um, it's also destroying the pristine environment as a lot of these constructions takes place in habitat of endangered species. Um, we see the same thing, similar thing um, in Red Hill with the oil spill also um, killing the environment as well as um, Okinawa in Japan. Um, and I remember seeing a comment earlier drawing the parallel between China and Japan and uh, that uh, made a very good point that the U.S. is using Japan to kind of uh, counter China in the Asia Pacific region, specifically um, China, uh, China, Japan being one of the Axis powers during World War II. Um, after the war, they adopted a constitution, a very pacifist constitution. But by the end of last year, the U.S. is pushing Japan to steer away from its pacifist past for the past um from his past pacifist path uh, in the past 60, 70 years and starting buying, uh, spending millions to buy weapons from American arms manufacturers. Um, in addition to the militarization of the Asia Pacific, we also see um, the manufacture of consent of war and also just driving hate within uh, domestically and Asian Americans are bearing the blunt of the, the brunt of the attack. And Nikki already went through some really amazing data, but also individual incidents. So I'm, I, I have like a lot of same sources because uh, Stop API 8 is just such an amazing project. So I, I just use their data and Nikki already went over those, which is great. Um, so unlike the other two speakers, I'm a campaigner with Code Pink. So my job is not just to educate, but also inviting all of you to joining in this uh, movement to call for peace uh, with China, even though we went over some really disturbing things, <laughs> some uh, really disheartening things today, but really the veil is really thin that we can easily disrupt it with common sense. Um, just this weekend, the New York Times editorial board published an op-ed uh, calling for peace with China. Uh, this might have been the first time in history that this um, one of the biggest warmongering news outlet is publishing a, a piece calling for peace. Um, and just carry on that um, inspiration. Uh, Michael earlier mentioned that um, there's a bill in Texas, um, or was it Nikki? Oh, I think it was Nikki, sorry. Uh, a bill in Texas, uh, uh, SB uh, 147, which would ban uh, Chinese nationals from uh, owning land in the state of Texas. And we actually have some friends in San Francisco who recently published an article in San Francisco Chronicles um, raising awareness about it. And we are looking to help them to build a campaign about it. Um, I know Michael is with us today. I haven't seen Julie's name, but if you have any um contact in Texas who would like to um, work together and uh, organize something in Texas, please let us know, let me know, and then I will relay all of your messages to um, our friends in San Francisco. Um, also, um, two other activi uh, activists with our China's and our enemy campaign, uh, Linda and Steve, they are based out in Michigan, and they are actually starting their own local chapter of U.S. Uh, China People's Friendship Association. Uh, I connected them with Duncan a while ago, and hopefully uh, they can work together. 
and um, produce more, uh, more uh, a lo uh, great local movements. But I also wanted to share um, a few pictures from their first event, which took place um, a week ago. So they had, um, this is Dr. Chen, um, who is a scholar on Chinese uh, language and uh, writing etymology. And basically their first event was just to talk about uh, Chinese culture, specifically Chinese calligraphy, um, how each Chinese character comes to be. Uh, this is the Chinese symbol for peace. Uh, and it's, con it's made up of the symbol for grain and also the mouth. So in Chinese culture, the peace means that we are meeting people's needs and and everyone um, all got to produce their own cal uh, calligraphy. Uh, and we loved seeing all of the report back from our friends uh, in Michigan. And uh, in the future, we are hoping to have all of our advocates to have some sort of uh, friendship building events in the future. Um, if you RSVP for the event today, I will make sure to send the resources to you uh, in a few days. And hopefully uh, Nikki will also share her slides with me and I will make sure to send those out too. Uh, also this Saturday, March 18th um, is the 20th anniversary of the US invasion of Iraq and Code Pink and the coalition of peace organizations are demanding um, and to U.S. wars and no war with China in Washington, D.C. and across the country. We will have information for you to find out um, what cities are having these actions. Um, and we hope that if you are able to make it, you can bring China is not an enemy message to the action in your area. So thank you all for being here. And I look forward to our Q&A. Thank you so much, Wei. Um... Yeah, working for peace. Um, uh, working for peace is going to be so beneficial, not only in term, terms of preventing war, but also uh, beneficial to the situation of Asian and Chinese Americans and all Americans here in the U.S. Um, so thanks again to all our uh, speakers for a very informative program, emphasizing the connections of foreign policy and, and domestic uh, situation. Now, we do have time for a couple of questions. So I saw a question in the chat, which um, any of the panelists could address. It basically asked about um, how, you know, what is the connection of the police to um, uh, anti-Asian and anti-Chinese racist incidents? Um, are there examples where the police are perpetrating these incidents or uh, how, does, how do the police factor in? Does anybody want to uh, try to answer that one? Sure, sure. Yeah, I, I can I can speak to that a little bit, but I'd be happy to hear from Michael and, and Wei as well. Um, um, racist policing has absolutely impacted Asian and Asian Americans. Racist policing is something that um, uh, uh, is anti-Asian racism. Um, the cases of, of, of Christian Hall, um, also of, of um, or if, uh, Faisal, uh, if, uh, UMass Boston, former UMass Boston student. Um, yeah, so many, there's, there's so many examples. Um, and, and oftentimes I think that uh, um, uh, uh, police brutality and racist policing is thought of as an issue that Asian Americans are not concerned with. Um, or Chinese or Americans are not concerned with, or Chinese people are not concerned with. Um, and uh, that's absolutely, um, um, I absolutely don't think that's the case. Um, and there are many times when Asians have been victims of, of racist police and we should hold them accountable and work towards creating uh, um, assist all systems that are free of racism and xenophobia and violence and hatred. Anybody else would like to comment on that? Okay, there was there's another um, question asking about the much publicized myth of the of the so-called model uh, model minority. Asians are the model minority. So what's all this fuss about anyway? Uh, anybody want to comment on our, our are Asians model minority?
well, it's, uh, so I see. I think the the you know, I mean, I think it has to do with you know the the interests of the country. I mean, when when China when the Chinese and actually Asian labor overall uh, came to U.S., it was only because it was a need for labor. Uh, initially, I mean, at that time, when the United States acquired California from Mexico, there was only 165,000 people in that whole area, uh, and they need and they wanted to develop it, and there was there was you know, and so that's why. Chinese labor initially was welcome. So, you know, it wasn't, a, I think it's home put in thing about the railroad, but it wasn't just the railroad, it was mining, it was agriculture. You know, the creation of agriculture in, in California had, had to do with a lot of building of, of dikes and levees and all these sorts of things. And so, the, and so all that Asian labor was welcome. But once, and of course the, the transcontinental railroad hadn't been built. So, so there was no, it was hard for white labor to come over to, to the to the Pacific. But once they arrived, you know, once it, they, they started to compete, white labor competed with Asian labor, then that's when China, uh, Chinese and other Asians were driven out. And 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 they were they were being driven out of different industries. So I think in a similar way, when the model minority in the post-World War II period, the United States was a dominant superpower, right? And had a, they had a different role. They had to manage all these different countries. So part of the reason for uh, having a, be a better attitude toward uh, different races is that they had also had to try to win over a lot of countries of color, as well as you know European countries. So so that's one thing. And it, but also in terms of managing all this, they needed people to. Um, help administer and manage uh you know global affairs so that's you know and and that's why you know in the, basically the big reform immigration law that the 1965 immigration reform law um they put a, had a preference for managers and professionals and that included uh a lot of people from unexpectedly though from Asia uh, and so and that's the beginning of I think you know what uh, uh, about the, the beginning of the Chinese modern minority myth that's when the Chinese the class composition of Chinese and Asians begin to really change the, you know the, the other thing of course is that the um, they wanted because I had mentioned that the Chinese community had a staunch anti-communist leadership. And they also had a philosophy about keeping the, the community shouldn't make trouble, should get along. And so that um, and so that to the extent that they were able to promote that among the 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 the, the Chinese, and I think some of the other Asian communities had, leadership had the same attitude. That was a counterpoint. To what was happening at the time, which was the civil rights movement, where African Americans were making trouble, and Asians were being told by their own leadership and you know not to make trouble. So I think that's that is the origins of the modern minority myth. But the fact that you know Asians have been you know be able to do relatively well economically here in this country, you know, also provides a basis for you know for them promoting that that myth. So, I mean, that's just my take on it. I don't know what others might have. Um, can I just quickly add to this? Um, I'm also going to like take off my Code Pink hat for a little bit because um, before Code Pink, my activism was mainly about um, organizing solidarity among all people of color against um, for anti-racism. Uh, so I, I definitely had to confront the model minority myth myself a little uh, for a while. And like Michael mentioned uh, correctly, um, uh, I, I think the origin of the term model minority, uh, I think it came from actually a New York Times article. So uh, again, what is with New York Times anyway, um, published in the 70s, actually praising uh, Japanese immigrants um, about their quote-unquote work ethics kind of as a justification that if um, 
these people of color can work hard to make a good li living for themselves than um, other people of color who have experienced this um, institutional racism that barred them from economic well-being, financial well-being. It's only their own uh, flaw and um, basically kind of scapegoating um, uh, these people instead of actually addressing the systemic injustice. And we see that even today um, as going back to that last question with um, policing. Um, uh, yeah, a lot to unpack. Um, but I think um, our, um, at Code Pink, we are um, anti-imperialist um, organization, and we do recognize that there is systemic racism in our country, and um, we need to all work together and not let model minority being a weed um, that divide us. Um, and work together towards a peaceful future. Okay, thanks. Um, just to remind people, we said at the beginning that we need to put questions in, into the chat. Um, so I think we have time for maybe, maybe more, we're about an hour right now, maybe uh, one more question. Um, There's a reference to Chinatown Rising, which I assume is a film um, or a video about Asians, Blacks, uh, and Brown uniting to form ethnic studies. Uh, um, that may have been at San Francisco State. I'm not sure. There's another reference to um, the internment camps during World War II, uh, where the Japanese were Japanese people were sent. Um, just another very important fact in terms of historical fact. Um, and um, maybe somebody could put code pinks, uh, um, some of the links to their activities into the chat. And there's also a link to some information about the Friendship Association um, could go into the chat. So I think it's about time to close now. Um, and I, I want to very much thank all of our panelists, Michael, Nikki, and Wei, and everybody who joined us and participated in the discussions. And we also want to thank all three co-sponsoring organizations, and we, and particularly thank Code Pink uh, for doing the technical support behind the scenes. Um, so I think there's some information about how to support Code Pink's campaign for peace um, and how to contact the U.S.-China People's Friendship Association or a membership organization. You wel you're welcome to join us. Um, our sole principle is upholding the One China policy. Um, this webinar was recorded, uh, will be available on the website of Code Pink. Um, and uh, uh, we're building a, a website for the U.S.-China People's Friendship Association in New England, and we're going to post it on there as well. Um, all of the organizations can be contacted. Um, we will send out this recording and um, information and links uh, uh, about the organizations and the activities. Um, so I want to thank everyone again. Uh, does any one of the panelists, do the panelists want to have any final words now? Um, just very quickly, I did see a question. I think it was early on um, about someone asking what, uh, because I mentioned that the veil is thin. So what messaging can we use? Um, can we rely on to cut through that veil most effectively? And I, I just want to quickly touch on that. Uh, so one of the things um, asked uh, that person who asked the question is definitely that Asian Americans and Pacific Islander community are bearing the brunt of the attack on China. Um, and also secondly, is that the military buildup, especially as we see in the uh, Asia Pacific is not only um, destroying people's lives, but also hurting the environment. So we need to put people on planet before um, war profiteering. Um, and lastly, um, 
also uh, because uh, there's with all of these uh, ongoing aggression with China and also just like viewing China as our enemy, uh, we are missing out on opportunities to collaborate with this uh, country with one and a half billion people, second largest economy in the world on things like broker in peace um, in Ukraine, um, solving the climate crisis and also addressing glo uh, global health and also poverty. Um, so yeah, cooperation before competition. Um, we want to stop Asian hate and also we need to save the planet. Those are the three uh, most effective uh, messaging, I think. Thank you so much. A any final comments from the other panelists? Um, if, if not, um, let's give a round of applause to all the panelists and to Code Pink. And um, good night, everybody. And uh, hope we will see you soon. Bye-bye.